Great. Welcome, everybody. Um, I think we should start. I've got a good number here, and we've got a really great panel that we want to make the most of the use of our time. Um, so, welcome, everyone, to this ITAD webinar on how can evaluation work support greater vaccine equity for COVID-19. I'll start by introducing myself. My name is Sam McPherson. I'm, I'm a partner here at ITAD um, and lead the human development practice um, with a colleague, John Cooper, and we um, um, that practice oversees health, education, and WASH. Um, for those of you who don't know ITAD, we're a global monitoring, evaluation, and learning consultancy based in, in UK, in the south of England, by the sea. Um, our focus is on generating evidence to support our partners working across the field of international development um, to be more effective in their programming. Um, within our health portfolio, the type of partners we work for include the Global Fund, Gavi, the UK government, of course, Welcome, the Gates Foundation, Unitaid, and, and many, many others. And that gives us an opportunity to have great insights into both the global health hands, hands, landscape and the challenges that those players are facing within that landscape. And the issues around vaccine equity and COVID, of course, is um, a challenge that's facing all those organisations in one way or the other, and us too. Um, and last summer, we began framing some of our key questions around vaccine equity and actually watching them play out in real time. And that's why we felt we really wanted to have a session to get people to talk about this. So what's the current situation of vaccine equity? As of yesterday, according to WHO, just under 5% of the world's population have received at least one COVID-19 vaccine dose. But looking behind the headline figures, of course, disparities quickly become clear. We know them, we hear them, we see them in the newspapers on a daily basis. High income countries represent only 16% of the world's population, but they have purchased more than half of the COVID-19 vaccines to date. This looks like 4.6 billion confirmed doses. By comparison, COVAX, the Global Initiative for Equitable COVID-19 Vaccine Distribution, have purchased a confirmed 1.1 billion doses, so a quarter of the available doses currently purchased by the high-income countries. Half of the 2 billion doses COVAX aims to buy up by the end of the year will be distributed across high-risk populations in 92 low- and middle-income countries. And indeed, there is a success story, despite what people say. 38 million doses have just been distributed to eligible economies to date. However, the pace of wealthy countries buy up has led to gloomy predictions. The Economist Intelligence Unit, for example, predicted that in poorer countries, widespread vaccination coverage will not be achieved before 2023, if at all. So what can we learn? How we can we course correct with this natural experiment that we're all seeing right now around vaccinating the world? We know that leaving COVID-19 to endure for longer in countries with less ability to manage the pandemic will not only have devastating domestic impacts, but also likely lead to the emergence of new, new variants. And econ economically, high-income countries will lose out. The interconnected world of the global supply chains that we inhabit means that 49% of the pandemic's global cost in 2021 alone will be borne by advanced economies, even if we achieve universal vaccination in, in their own countries. So the idea that we can just sort it out ourselves and let everyone else get on of on it, of course, is, is, is not, not, not real. As evaluators, we want to know how we can contribute to solving the debates at the heart of these conversations. And that's what's the heart of this, heart of this session we're going to have now. How can evaluation approaches unpack, inform and deliver better vaccine equity outcomes? We recognise the gravity of this moment. We're looking at an unprecedented wealth of information on how to respond to the mass vaccination needs on the global level and get it right for the next pandemic. We really are seeing a, an experiment un, performing under, under our, eyes, our, our own eyes. We really want to try and learn from that. We want to grasp the moment and exercise the responsibility of the global health community to generate rich evidence and learnings. To guide the conversation on just how to do that and the challenges along the way, I'm delighted, or we're delighted, to bring together a really impressive panel today. I'm going to get to them right as soon as I can. Before I hand over to you, to them. I wanted to make you all aware that the live chat on, on, the, on the platform you're on is available and you can post your questions in real time as we go along. And if you see someone has already asked your question or there's a question you're really interested in, please vote them up and so we can focus on the big questions that people are focusing on. Um, the, the availability of the panel is, I think we've got everyone here, which is brilliant, um, but I'm aware that some of them, um, because they're all so much so involved in the front line of, of, of responding to the epidemic, of the pandemic, uh, 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 they won't all be here for the full hour, but we'll make the best of their time as they come in and out as we move on. 
Um, so I'm delighted to introduce um, the four speakers that we have um, today. I'm going to start with Mirahan Angler Simao, who's the Assistant Director General of Access to Medicines and Health Products at World WHO. Then we've got Laura Crow, who's a Senior Program Manager for Monitoring at Gabi, the Vaccines Alliance. Then we've got Luis Chingandu, who's Director of Evidence at Influence at Frontline AIDS. And then we've finally got Jan Gandhi, who's just arrived from COVAX Coordinator UNICEF. Welcome, Jan. Um, so before I go on, I'm going to pass over now to um, Marianne Jilla, who's going to open up the, the, the panel with her reflections um, that she's going to talk to now. So, Laura, you're going to bring perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sam. You almost pronounced my name right, but it, <laughs> it's good. You pronounce it in German way first, but I see that you're not German. <laughs> I, I did practice. But I've obviously got <laughs> so let, let, let me say quickly a, a few introductory words and, and first of all, uh, a disclosure of, because I'm not an evaluator, I'm, I used to be a pediatrician, but I've been working in public health 40 years of my professional life, which dates me, I'm quite old right now, but it, but it's also, uh, but there are several questions that I would like to pose to you, especially considering the context that we are living in. You know, like mid last year, we had no idea, you know that mid last year, we had like 200, at least 200 vaccine candidates. In the, the context where we started discussing the, the fair and equitable allocation, where was and even the creation of the COVAX facility was a context where we did not know if any of these vaccines would be uh, safe and effective, right? This, this is so because of, right now, when we look back, you know, well, in December we had Pfizer uh, 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 register emergency use authorization, and then it went, and suddenly we have several. There are 10 vaccines that are being used in the world now with four different platforms. Out of these 10 vaccines, four of them have been issued an emergency use by WHO. Three of them will be assessed by the end of this month for in, uh, approval or not. And we have other four vaccines candidates that are, uh, are initiating the process to get an emergency use listing by WHO. So, and then we say, okay, we have all this, pro it's good, the vaccines will help to end this acute phase of this pandemic, but we are seeing this, and they were developed in unprecedented speed, but what we are seeing is a repetition of previous mistakes, right? That we went through, when we started discussing the fair allocation framework was because we wanted to avoid what happened with H1N1. Right, where it took like seven months for vaccines to reach low and middle income countries. And when they came, uh, the pandemic had ended. Right? And we also wanted to avoid what happened with HIV, where it took 10 years. Right? We, we hope this pandemic won't last 10 years. But now, like Sam was saying, we have a data from yesterday that 800 million doses have been uh, uh, deployed so far in the world. 83% have gone to high income and upper middle income countries. And out of the 800 million, 38.5 million were, were distributed through the, the COVAX facility. Uh, the, the rationale, the core issue around the organization of the facility was the aim to have all countries having access to vaccines without having to go to bilateral deals or having to to do the, all these difficult negotiations that happened, right? But then we have, we are facing a severe supply and a funding still an issue, it's part of the problem, but it's not a problem. So bilateral agreements have skewed the market, right? There's big bilateral agreements in high concentration, but we are also facing problems, for example, with export bans, right? We have a major provider in India, the SII is, is in normal times is the, the biggest vaccine producer in the world. So India is, has a raging epidemic right now. So the moral dilemma is very clear. If we, although we can't touch these structural issues in the short time, I mean like poverty, lack of access to 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 employment and so on, the the equity in health we can. You know, and this is where we, 
I think it's super important to ask the right questions right now because they will also help us. Because as we speak, WHO is putting, member states are discussing the possibility of approving a pandemic treaty, treaty you know, that will be, would be approved next year at the World Health Assembly in 2022. And why is it important, a convention, a treaty? It's because it creates obligations for member states and other stakeholders. The other example that I, I know everyone knows is the Tobacco Convention. Right, you know how it takes time, but it creates the, the legal environment for certain obligations to be mandatory. So the work that you are doing in the question, the object of this seminar, they can help also to frame what, what are the issues for the whatever you can produce in this one year time. It will help not only to redirect what we are doing right now, but could help for framing the 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 future pandemic landscape. So I, I, there are some ideas, you know, we discussed internally, but regarding topics, for example, uh, when we did the, the, the fair allocation framework, we established principles that, that went from transparency to regulatory and quality assurance. So it would be good if you could look at the principles and see, you know, when you're doing any assessment, how, how, how well did we do you know, because these principles were endorsed by member states and so, but at the same time, Sam was mentioned the priority populations to be vaccinated. What we did or when we established on the allocation framework and the SAGE, which is the Strategic Advisory Group on Immunization, WHO, we looked at the public health goals and we thought that for 2021, we have two goals. One is protect health systems. That's why we're saying vaccinate all health workers first. I, and second was to, to, to address high priority populations that are at higher risk of dying, right? So these are the two things. The third thing I would suggest, was that the right decision or not? You know, that's uh, the right, because this was very polemic, very controversial. To what extent solidarity, solidarity is appearing in a lot of the political discourse, right? To what extent solidarity actually results in concrete equitable access. You know, the access, sharing of excess doses, for example, you know, to, to the COVAX facility. So I'm just putting some questions to you, right? Uh, there are, of course, the inequalities, the differences, in, uh, because of uh, you see ethnic, ethnicity and you see uh, lower income, country, uh, not countries, populations inside, even high income countries, with different uh, health outcomes related to COVID. The other issue is related to availability and affordability. And uh, there is a, a controversy too. Is this scarce supply that we have right now, is it real or is it skewed by the, the bilateral agreements? You know, is it a problem of equitable distribution or do we actually do have uh, low numbers of vaccines globally? I think we don't know that. Yeah. And because several of the things we collect data from different sites, but it's important. To what extent intellectual property protection does limit technology transfer to increase manufacturing capacity? That's a, a super question right now. It's with a waiver discussion at the Trips Council and, and so on. And, um, and the other thing is, is what's happening in countries in terms of the recommendations for the priority populations right where well, we have this question right now and we're trying to address this but this would be an important question we see countries that have used uh, the doses that were allocated to to like vaccinate military according to their priorities so to what extent the sage recommendations actually were being taken over by countries? these are just initial thoughts sam over Great. Thank you, Dr. Smell. That's that's a great way of kicking stuff off and getting the questions. I've been noting them down. We'll bring them back to the, the panel afterwards. Thank you for your time. Um, okay, so next is um, Laura Kraft from the Gavi. Good afternoon. My name is Laura Craw. I work with the monitoring, evaluation, and learning team in Gavi. Um, and involved very closely with COVAX. It's a pleasure to be with you all here today. 
In terms of my present role, um, as working as part of the Gavi Monitoring, Evaluation and Learning Team, I'm engaging across the board um, related to COVAX, um, primarily working closely with the centralised evaluation team who are leading a multi-stage mixed methods evaluation of COVAX from design and processes through to results and impact, uh, working very closely with our evaluation advisory committee who report directly to the Gavi board. Equity and equitable access and distribution will be one of the key themes for these evaluation efforts. And then working um, more broadly across complementary monitoring and learning activities, such as working closely with our partners to ensure that we have appropriate monitoring tools and guidance in place, and that these emphasize and facilitate a focus on equitable access, distribution and uptake and contributing to learning and more rapid documentation and syntheses as we progress to help inform course correction and reflection as we go along with COVAX. In terms of debates that are playing out right now, um, two key ones, for example, are that of um, cross-country equity and the question of pace. So we just saw the great news that COVAX has now reached 100 economies, yet pace remains a key issue. How can we ensure that those economies that have not yet introduced COVID-19 vaccines get access to these vaccines as quickly as possible? And then also the debate around intra-country equity. So lots of focus right now on monitoring uptake in countries and ensuring target populations and high risk groups are indeed risk reached. In terms of the roles, role of evidence in achieving equitable outcomes, um, it has a huge role to play. Um, to name just a few critical roles evidence is playing. Um, so one, the learning agenda across countries. Um, so for example, helping address key questions, which delivery strategies are proving most effective? For example, how well are mass vaccination sites um, working? And we're having to learn how to adapt our, our products as we go along. So for example, discussing with country colleagues, um, recently they said that three to four minute video shorts are likely far more useful for them than lengthy evidence briefs. Then in terms of country implementation monitoring, um, really trying to um, facilitate real time um, understanding of who is getting vaccinated. Are we succeeding in vaccinating higher risk target population groups and particularly healthcare workers in line with SAGE guidance and framework? Um, but also then still retaining the uh, need for more in-depth and comprehensive monitoring, evaluation and learning to really dig deeper um, and understand why we are seeing what we are seeing. And finally, making sure that we retain the right balance between learning and accountability as um, we advance with our resource mobilization efforts related to COVAX, making sure that we retain that balance. In terms of evaluating the global mechanisms for equitable vaccine distribution, I personally think it's important to be as comprehensive and inclusive as possible when scoping. Um, we have a responsibility to the global health community and beyond to maximize learning here. So evaluating end to end and um, thinking right through from design and process um, through to actual implementation outcomes and impact. Um, along those ways, some thoughts. So for example, at design and governance of COVAX, do we have the appropriate engagement mechanisms and the right stakeholders engaged in design and governance? In terms of the allocation mechanism, how are we ensuring equitable, equitable allocation across countries? Then in terms of implementation, as I've already said, to what extent are we um, able to reach and vaccinate target population groups? How equity sensitive and effective are different delivery strategies? But also looking at more specific elements of COVAX as well, for example, such as the uh, humanitarian buffer. Um, and although this is a measure of last resort, it is there to ensure that no communities are left behind, such as IDPs, migrants, refugees, and other communities. And finally, for me, a big question will be, what can we learn from COVID-19 programs and COVAX, um, our response and integrate it back into our Gavi 5.0 strategy, which has equity as a cornerstone um, through our zero dose focus and each of our strategy pillars. So taking the lessons learned and applying them back to our broader Gavi strategy. Thank you very Thank much. You very much. Thank you, great, Laura. And um, you're going to be here. You're here in real, real time for the the, the plenary afterwards. So good stuff. Um, Luis, I think is next from Frontline Aids. I'm talking for South Africa. My name is Luis Chingandu. I'm the director of evidence and influence at Frontline Aids. 
Frontline AIDS is a member of the People's Vaccine Alliance, which is a coalition of over 50 organizations that include the African Alliance, Oxfam, Public Citizen, and UNAIDS, and many others that are calling for equitable access to the distribution of COVID-19 vaccine. The People's Alliance has been involved in numerous campaign activities for months now, uh, and many of those activities are all pointed towards calling for all pharmaceutical corporations working on COVID-19 vaccines to openly share their technology and intellectual property through the World Health Organization COVID-19 Technology Access Pool, commonly called CTEP, which will speed up and ramp up the production and rollout of vaccines to all countries. The, people, you know, the, the lifting of pharmaceutical monopo monopolies and the sharing of technology is urgently needed in order for us to boost vaccine supplies. It is unacceptable that rich countries can continue to defend monopolies of pharmaceutical giants um, at the expense of human life. We all know that if one is not safe, we are all not safe. And in this case, even if the rich countries vaccinated all their people and the poor countries did not vaccinate their people, we would end up with mutated viruses that would make the current vaccines useless and would require us to go back to the drawing board to develop more vaccines. So it is important that uh, the, we remove these monopolies and we, re we bring to an end this vaccine apartheid that seems to be thriving right at this moment. In our work, we have been calling uh, not only to pharmaceutical uh, chief executives, we have also been calling to the US President Joe Biden and to other presidents from the G7 nations and the G20 nations to all rally behind removal of monopolies. And we are looking forward in April uh, that there will be, as the, the discussions continue under WTO, they, they will see more flexibilities applied to allow wider production of, of, of vaccines in many of these countries where we know a lot of pharmaceuticals are already poised and waiting just to produce the vaccines. What we need is for the rich pharmaceutical companies to share the recipe. That is all we need to make vaccines available. The second question I would like to address is the issue of what is the role of evidence in achieving equitable outcomes um, and how can data and evaluative research help to navigate this terrain in real time. Our, our, we all know that without data, you're shooting in the dark. If you don't know how many people you're vaccinating, if you don't know if we are vaccinating the right people, how on earth are we going to be able to determine whether we need more vaccines and where we need them? And therefore, it's important that research institutions are agently capacitated to put in place high technology to be able to track production and distribution of vaccines in real time in order to inform future decisions. The People's Vaccine Alliance engaged in a study that asked epidemiologists to say what would happen if the bulk of the work um, is not, the, the bulk of the world is not vaccinated. And they came back and informed us that at least 88% um, of them believe that we would have viral mutations. And if we do have viral mutations, we know this is going to be a setback for everybody. My last point which I want to address is if we were evaluating this global mechanism for equitable vaccine distribution, what kind of questions would we ask? I suggest three main questions. One is what mechanism have been put in place to effectively monitor and track the distribution of vaccines to countries of highest need. The second question is, what is the role of civil society organizations in ensuring distribution of vaccines to all, all countries? And finally, how are we defining equitable distribution? Do we have a uniform definition? Because without a uniform definition, we are going to be measuring different things. Thank you.
Great, thank you. Um, and the final speaker is um, Gian Gandhi, who's I think joining us from New York. Back to you. Welcome. Thanks, Sam. Um, so I'm uh, Gian Gandhi, the, uh, the coordinator for COVID vaccine access at UNICEF Supply. Um, on the UNICEF side, just to speak about um, our role in, in, in COVAX specifically. So we, we've been engaged in the um, conceptualization with, with Gavi and, and WHO um, and the preparedness in, uh, as, we, as we work towards the, the vaccine over the previous months. And, and now, of course, in practice and in, in rolling that out with, with our partners and the core partners of, of COVAX. Um, and, uh, and so what that means is we, we engaged early on in, in the design of COVAX um, with those partners. Um, and uh, and um, while we were waiting for the vaccines and, and the mercurial efforts of, of um, scientists to bring those vaccines about to, to help countries to, to prepare for um, the rollout of the vaccines and, and of course signing then the contracts with manufacturers. Um, and now of course we're, um, we're, we've moved into the, the the work to to actually roll out those vaccines, and we're we're observing on the ground how how countries are are doing against those national vaccine deployment plans that uh, they put in place, um, and so we're starting to see you know some of the the emerging um, elements that that Dr. Samal and um, and uh, and other colleagues have talked about in terms of within country equity issues as well as between country equity issues, and I think sort of turning to the role of of data and, and evaluation. Um, of global mechanisms like COVAX. I think, you know, from, from our side, what we see is it's, it's important to start with, with understanding how practice is deviating from our plans. Um, but more than just the plans, whether they're the global plans of, of COVAX or the, the national vaccine deployment plans um, that have been mentioned, um, I think it's also important to look at the underlying assumptions um, that were used in the design, certainly, and the conceptualization of COVAX. And a couple of examples, when we were working on the design of COVAX, it was um, envisioned as a, a mechanism that would negate the need for bilateral deals. Um, and of course, for, for many reasons, um, um, it hasn't turned out that way. And I think it's important to understand that assumption, but also why that assumption um, proved not to be you know, where we landed in the end. Um, another example, I think, is is that we we assumed that that we needed to prioritize, of course, access to very limited supply against um, vaccines that met a minimum standard as as defined by WHO's target product profile um, and diversity of the supply base, not knowing which which R and D target would would emerge as as being successful. And I think now we're with, and we we prioritize those things of diversity and access over potential um, modest differences in the vaccine. Um, and I think, you know, some of the, the inequities or perceptions of inequity now relate to, to some of those assumptions and, and, and how things have changed in practice. Um, I think the other thing to say is, you know, the, the challenges um, that, that we see certainly on the market side in terms of access um, um, are, are difficult to measure uh, because the information is not in the public domain for so much of that, that information, whether it's the the contractual underpinnings of bilateral deals um, that, that, of course, are driving um, inequities. And, and so I think there is a, an evaluative challenge in, in trying to, to measure and monitor uh, when, when our, our view of the world is somewhat truncated. Um, I think, you know, the, the other thing to, to say here is perhaps a perennial challenge um, with evaluation and in, in of, of government programs, which is that certainly some of the in-country details um, related to the rollout of vaccines now uh, will rely on government administrative data in the short term. Um, and of course, those, those data systems, certainly in lower middle income countries, um, are not you know, at the same levels of, of some higher income countries. And that data isn't, of course, readily available, certainly not always in real time. And so, so I think we, we often are looking at kind of data from, from weeks or months ago on, on the rollout um, or indeed kind of anecdotal information rather than, you know, full, full pictures of, of what's actually happening on the ground. Um, I think, you know, maybe just to, 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 to lay out a couple of concepts very quickly or a few concepts in terms of um, the differences, no judgment on whether these, these amount to, 
you know, equitable distributions or inequities. Um, but we, I think um, Laura mentioned some of the sort of temporal differences in access. So um, when, certainly when you look at, at countries, but also populations within countries, there are differences. Uh, differences in, in terms of access to, to what we as, as UN organizations would consider quality assured vaccines versus um, vaccines that may have a, a national regulatory approval, but, but certainly not, uh, say, a WHO emergency use listing. Um, those are those could turn out to be important differences. They could they could be kind of um, you know just just details. Um, um, there's also perhaps unobservable differences at this moment in time in terms of effectiveness of vaccines, perhaps driven by underlying differences in epidemiological context, the, the variants of concern that are spreading in some countries more than in others, um, which will impact potentially the effectiveness of vaccines, not not the efficacy. Of, um, and then, of course, you know, related to that, potential differences in, in the effectiveness driven by dose sparing strategies within countries. Certainly, we're seeing some countries try to vaccinate as many uh, people as they can with the available supply they have within country. Um, others are, are trying to ensure that they have enough doses to fully immunize the, the target populations. And so how those, those dose sparing approaches impact effectiveness is something that we're, you know, we're still learning um, and we won't have full data on. And when you combine that with, I think Doc, Dr. Simao mentioned, you know, some of the um, export controls that we're experiencing, for example, out of India, where, where some of the differences end up being um, uncontrollable by a global mechanism. I think it's important to put those in context. Differences in coverage, I think have been mentioned. Differences in, in age-related targeting. We've seen, of course, everyone um, acknowledge the importance of protecting those at highest risk, whether those are frontline healthcare workers, frontline workers, or of course the elderly. So those age differences will emerge. Um, yeah, Jan, just, um, just, just to, sorry to interrupt. Just, and one last. just I'll get you yeah. your last comment, but I just want to catch Marianne uh, Dr. Samal because I think she's just about to lead to another conference. So I'll sure. get her to make a couple of comments, then bring back to you. I don't know if you've got time, Dr. Samal. Not for one minute. And apologies, the colleague from UNICEF. It's super interesting what you're saying. But I, you know, I, I was thinking, Sam, that we. We we are we will need to move some time from an emergency mode to a, a more structured approach. And I think and I, I was looking at the chat and the many many questions, right? And I, I I would urge you who work on evaluation to try to get to what are the core questions that need to be answered now. We even need to correct our course, you know this this year, you know in preparation for next year. And what are the Four questions that will help us frame the, the how we the world should what are the lessons learned and that we frame for the next pandemic. You know that I, I would leave these two messages because I, I know we have many, many questions. What what's your view? And I, I look forward to getting the, the results of this 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 conversation, this debate. What are your views? What are the key issues that we need to know in like in a few months' time? You know that will help us correct our, our and I'm talking here, Gabi and, and UNICEF, who are together with us on this, right? We are. What are what is it that the global partners need to know to get the correct course? Thank you so much, and I'm I'm really sorry. This is fascinating debate, and I think it will help us a lot. Uh, keep in touch. Sorry. Thank you. Um, back to you, Jan, and 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 thank you, Dr. Samal. Thanks, and, and I think you know that's a good way to 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 kind of almost leave it for me. Hi, if we, we cut people off, what's happened? Uh, I, think, uh, I think go ahead, Sam. I, I think we lost. Going. I think we've lost a few people, but uh, yeah. hopefully they'll rejoin. Okay, great. 
Um, yeah, when Jan comes back in, we'll we'll hook him back into the conversation. Um, what I want to do just now is to to pass back to the panel for any reflections on what they've just heard. They've all heard each other's sort of five minutes of presentation, and then we will open up to some of the questions. And we can see quite a few really interesting questions coming up, and so we'll bring them back to the to the group. So maybe I'll start with you, Laura, and um, uh, any reflections you have on what you just heard and and the framing. Sure. Yeah, I'll um I'll keep it brief because I've been keeping an eye um on the the questions and there's some some really rich questions and and also very welcome suggestions for potential evaluation questions as well. So um that's that's hugely helpful. Um yeah, in terms of um comments by by the other panelists, I think um some some very interesting points made. Um, I think a couple of things that that did stand out for me is. You know, I think we we have a responsibility to also be looking at and understanding the impact on the broader health system and health workforce. Um, that was a, a comment raised by my WHO colleague, um, and I think that's going to be incredibly important going going forward and and working with our country colleagues to to build back better. Um, so I thought that was a, a very uh, valid point to raise. Um, uh, my colleague from South Africa, I think um, one thing that she commented on that I think is is really something that we've been debating and I think evaluation has a role uh, to help answer is, is how can we be best utilising civil society going forward? Um, so what role can they be playing in, in um, advocacy, but also from a monitoring and accountability perspective as well? Um, and then a final comment um, raised by, by Guillaume that I think was really interesting was um, talking about the type of data that we have, um, and this links with the, the final comment from Dr. Samiao as well. Um, I think, you know, we're, we're going to have to maybe step away from our, our um, habit of looking to best, best methods and, and um, uh, fully robust uh, evaluation designs and um, appreciate the role of anecdotal real-time data as well. And I think particularly um, from the Gabby side, but I know in conversations with WHO and UNICEF as well, um, you know, we have been inundated with um, more unstructured data. So really, you know, hearing direct from the field what's going on, um, what are the big challenges? Um, and I think we, we again have a responsibility to facilitate the, the collation of what we're hearing um, to feed that into our monitoring and evaluation efforts. Um, and be helping address uh, some of the key challenges that we're hearing. Um, so I'll hand over to another colleague. Thanks. Thank you. And yeah, I think you just cut off, but we heard you, but the floor's back to you to any final comments, then I'll pass back to Luis. Sure, thanks. Um, hoping you can hear me now. Um, so actually it was very, one very last comment was a sort of kind of look to the future. I think what we're seeing is um, certainly that, that countries are starting to pivot um, and, and take different kind of operating assumptions. So we certainly see some countries starting to look at um, sort of a, a move and change and sort of changing the goalposts. When COVAX initiated, I think it was very much focused on trying to uh, um, cover the, the those at highest risk of exposure, those at highest risk of mortality, the first 20%, if you like, of, of most countries. And I think we've seen because of the success of, of research and development, and, and the successful rollout in higher income countries, the goalposts have really started to shift towards covering the majority of populations. Um, maybe, you know, even, even others sort of trying to cover, um, achieve herd immunity and, and local elimination. And I think some of those, um, or complete interruption of, of transmission, I think some of those changing goals going forward then have feedback loops. And we sort of end up back to where we started with, with more bilateral deals being um, put in place and more constraints and I think sort of seeing the echoes of what we saw if you like in the first phase of the pandemic reoccurring in the second is something that I think real-time um, monitoring and, and evaluation can can help course correct now and I think otherwise we're going to be in this sort of vicious cycle of replaying all the things that went wrong and I think you know this is not just true for if you like the rollout of the vaccine many of the things that we're experiencing whether it's export controls um, or indeed kind of um, nationalism were, were things that played out with with access to PPE, um, yeah. and I think we we kind of we tried to learn those lessons, but 
frankly, you know, in a in an open market and uh, and a global economy, some things are just um, there's only so much you can prepare and and, and address. So, but with that, I will um, I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you, thank you. Um, Lise, do you have anything, any brief comments to add? And then I, I'm going to hand over to my colleagues, Pippa and Marco, who have been diligently looking at all the questions coming in and, and managing them. Yes, I just want to make a, a brief comment. Um, the, there was a question on uh, how, since the high-income countries have selected to focus or to prioritise their own citizens, what can be done to change this? Um, and my response is that there's already a lot of activity that is going on to try to address this. And just, uh, the, I think many of you know that yesterday, we, through the People's Vaccine Alliance, we managed to mobilize no, Nobel Prize winners to write, to sign on a letter that has gone to the president of the US. And we are hoping similar letters will go to all the G7 uh, leaders to, again to continue to push them to shun monopolies and to move away from monopolies. We also need to learn from history. We know from HIV we had a similar situation and because of the delays in removing monopolies, we ended up losing a lot of people to HIV, which we shouldn't have done. And I think it's at this point it's important that we make sure that history doesn't repeat itself. But when it comes to evaluation, it's important that we evaluate the full continuum from the production right up to the person who is going to receive the vaccine. We need to look at different aspects of, of where are the bottlenecks and how do we unlock bottlenecks. Um, it, is, it is very hard to talk about equity when the cake is very small. And that is where we are at the moment. The cake is small, and you don't you you can talk as much as you want about equity until you increase the cake, you will not achieve equity. So it's it's quite important that we we monitor and track what is happening at the at the world trade level in terms of the conversations and discussions that are happening around the trips agreement, because that is where we are going to open up and increase supply. And then once we have supply, then we can start looking at the whole chain and uh, unlock bottlenecks and identify and unlock bottlenecks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks all to the panel um, for those great framing conversations. And now we're getting into some of the questions. Um, I'm going to hand over to my colleagues, Pippa and Marco, who've been working on this subject for some time and have been helping prepare this um, seminar. So over to you on, on the questions. Yeah, thank you, Sam, if that's okay, I'll go first. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of really interesting questions and I'm gonna try and uh, combine a few because I can see some common themes. Uh, there's one that relates more to perhaps health systems inequities. So there's a comment by uh, Masuma Mamadani on uh, uh, some of the issues that have been discussed previously, particularly by, by Gan on uh, challenges encountered within countries on vaccine distribution, reporting, monitoring, accountability structures, et cetera. So uh, going beyond, in other words, uh, just getting vaccines to low middle income countries, how can we, what, type, what type of evidence do we need in order to uh, understand what the health system inequities are and, and to help us address them? And there's also uh, a related question by Lamia Shehata, which is about how vaccine hesitancy is, uh, is being factored into evaluations of vaccine equity. And in particular, how do we move the discussion forward from uh, just being focused on the supply side. So we know that a big problem with uh, weak health systems where there's a lack of trust in the health system is low take up by citizens. So how do we evaluate, again, at country level, how inequity in, in, in country preparedness and in health systems uh, affect the, the, the response? So if that's okay, I'll start by addressing this question to Laura, and then we can uh, move on to uh, Louis, who uh, I think also has some interesting points on this, and uh, yeah, over. Yeah, thanks. Um, really great questions. Um, so I think on the on the first one about understanding health systems inequities, I think one thing, um, you know, uh, as an alliance, we've been working with countries on strengthening health systems for 
for several years. So I, I do think, um, you know, we have been keeping a close eye since the start of the pandemic on the impact on, on health systems um, and uh, been gathering data and working with countries to better understand those. Um, and WHO, for example, have been leading on some essential health services um, pulse surveys to make sure that we have a good understanding of, of the dynamic and, and impact in countries. Um, so I, I think there has been an effort to, to um, be collecting some real-time evidence and data to better understand. Um, but we also have to be realistic about um, the, the systems that are in place. And that's something that, that Guillain um, talked to. Um, for example, um, you know, there's a, there's a huge appetite right now for, for data from countries, but in some countries, um, we know their monitoring systems um, and data collection reporting are, are quite weak and have challenges. So I think we, it's behest upon us to, to think about how we can best support um, those in particular. Um, and then the second comment on vaccine hesitancy, um, yes, this is this has really come out as a as a key theme. Um, certainly, it will be factored in in, in our um, uh, learning agenda as well as our evaluation work. Um, understanding, for example, um, how well countries' risk communication plans are playing out, how well their social mobilisation advocacy efforts are working. Um, and then trying to facilitate cross-country uh, learning um, and sort of rapid exchanges on these. And, and one um, aspect that I think has been really helpful already on this is um, embracing some of the work done by learning networks that are out there. So, for example, Safe and Boost or the Geneva Learning Foundation, who have already had several um, platforms and discussions and exchanges um, with um, EPI colleagues and beyond. Um, and some of their topics that they've been really um, doing real-time sharing around has been exactly this. Um, what, what strategies do countries have in place? Um, what's proving effective? Um, and, and trying to share um, uh, evidence um, across those types of platforms. So I'll leave it there and hand over to another colleague. Thanks. Um, Dr. Lewis, could we hear from you next, please? Yes, thank you. Um, on the the issue of health systems uh, strengthening for many of the developing countries, I think it's an issue that has been on the discussion for many, many years, even before COVID hit uh, these countries. And we know uh, now with the advent of COVID, many of the health systems have even collapsed further. And it's important to take that into consideration. What has not happened in terms from, from an evaluator point is for us to get real clarity by countries to say we, where, where is each country in terms of the, their health systems, to what extent do they have the ability to quickly move vaccines once they get into the country to get to the people. We are already starting to see cracks. Uh, the, just this morning, someone sent me a message and I'm yet to check on this. Uh, they send me information that in Malawi, um, vaccines have just expired uh, because they just couldn't move them to get people vac vaccinated. And, and I, I am very sure we are going to be able to see more of that. But the question I have is, uh, uh, do governments even know what they need to have in place before they receive vaccines to facilitate quick movements of vaccines from the source right up to the individual who needs to be vaccinated. I do not think that it, that information is uh, is available, and I think this is an area where we, you know, st studies could quickly really provide relevant real time information on what what is the basic minimum health systems that you need to have in place, ready, waiting to be able to deliver a vaccine within the shortest period from the time that you receive the vaccine to vaccination. This is, there's a real gap there. When it comes to vaccine hes hesitance, again, we, this is not new. We know from HIV, even with HIV treatment, a lot of people, when they became available, people still chose to die uh, because they, they were afraid of side effects or for various myths and misconceptions. And this is when we talk about the role of civil society 
this is where civil society can really come and play a critical role in the, in the vaccine literacy to ensure that as we are uh, advocating for increase in supply, civil society is also working on, a, on a creating high vaccine literacy within the communities so that you have, uh, the communities are ready to receive uh, the vaccine. Ex our experience shows that when that is done well and effectively, you do get quite a huge upsurge in the people who want to access the, the, the vaccine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll hand over to Pip. Thank you, Lois, and uh, thank you, uh, everyone. I realise we're running quite short on time, so I'm uh, going to encourage the panel to keep it uh, as brief as possible. So we've heard about the kind of evidence required to sort of better understand and possibly course correct on equitable distribution, but I've got a slightly more retrospective question here, uh, which has been posted by Gabriele in the chat. Um, I'd be interested to hear the panel's thoughts on whether they believe the right balance was struck between acting quickly to meet the urgency of the vaccine situation um, as the pandemic broke out last year and, and inclusivity, um, whether that balance was struck with inclusivity in terms of stakeholders consulted, the governments that were engaged, um, in terms of thinking about the way in which global health players have responded to vaccine equity initiatives. So were there already some lessons learned here, I guess, um, and perhaps what, what studies or evidence could help to sharpen those? Um, I will direct that first to Guyane. Thank you. Thanks, Pippa, and thanks, Gabriele. It's a, <clears throat> it's a, it's a great question. You know, I, I think um, it, it sort of, the question is, is, is very much around kind of how do we um, take, you know, make decisions in a multi-stakeholder environment um, in real time in in preparedness efforts and and you know I think um it's certainly it's challenged all of us in some way and it certainly challenged the Gavi Alliance model in in some ways which is which was designed for very much kind of addressing endemic disease um, and bringing in you know um, the voices of all stakeholders um, um, in an, in a sort of appropriate way um, um, to, to both design policies and and uh, and you know make funding decisions and I think in this instance um, I think you know Gavi Gavi was was forced to kind of really really move things forward in real time and, and do those consultations while building the ship and so you know I think it will be will be uh, certainly a question that the will probably be to answer maybe if I uh, thing that relates to some of the other questions that came up and, and I come back to the underlying sort of operating assumptions. Um, um, so one of the assumptions of, of the COVAX facility was that the funding for um, delivery of doses within country was something that needed to be covered through domestic funds and via uh, multilateral development banks, the, the likes of the World Bank and, and um, Asian Development Bank to fund those, those efforts. And I think some of the challenges we're seeing now um, in terms of, you know, I think a mention of expiry of doses or doses not rolling out as quickly as possible. Um, what we're seeing anecdotally is that countries are saying they don't have the funds necessary to, to use vaccines appropriately or to roll them out quickly enough. Um, and I think this, this relates to sort of trying to ensure that a global architecture all lines up appropriately. So if, if Gavi um, and COVAX partners are securing the doses, that multilateral development banks and, and um, domestic funds are being used to then fund the delivery. And if those things don't all line up perfectly, then you end up with these, you know, the, the impacts of misalignment as, as are being discussed here. And I think, you know, is it a question of the operating assumptions are wrong or that we couldn't get all of the partners to, to play their part um, appropriately um, to make everything work? And, 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 and that, that relates to, to both governments as, as well as, you know, um, like I say, banks and, and COVAX partners alike. Um, the other thing is, of course, you know, the best laid plans, um, you know, in terms of, of preparedness efforts, WHO, UNICEF put out guidelines on COVID vaccine preparedness and deployment. Um, and, uh, and, and those were used as the sort of backstop for countries to then define their own vaccine deployment plans, which were um, reviewed to ensure, for example, SAGE uh, recommended uh, target groups were, were being appropriately targeted in the first rollout. But of course, 
what plays out in reality doesn't always look um, like what what was um, you know delineated in in the guidelines or in the plans themselves. And I think it's it's important that we kind of use those those um, bases as as our kind of foundation against which we're measuring um, going forward. Um, um, and then lastly, I guess the, the the issue of then kind of the the anecdotal information. Everything is done in a in a kind of fast moving environment. Um, and where we're, we're having to sort of take whether it's a safety signal or a um or, or changing knowledge and attitudes and preferences to vaccines and you know the mention of hesitancy reminded me of something we're seeing right now where people have received their first dose of a particular vaccine um but a, but knowledge and, and attitudes are changing about whether they're willing to accept the second dose and what does that mean then in terms of the numbers that will will eventually be fully vaccinated um and trying to design those those campaigns to address those changing um, attitudes, as you know, as as new information um, from other countries emerges on these vaccines. But I'll stop there. Over. Thank you, Jen. Great, great discussions and, and, and great questions and and uh, on the on the on the channels and and uh, feedback. Um, I'm going to I'm going to ask Laura because you're just about to go uh, for the last comment. Very very brief comment. A couple of words and same to Luis, and then I'll wrap up. Yeah. Yes, I just want to briefly um, talk about civil society engagement when we are looking at uh, balancing acting quickly with inclusivity. And in this case, it, I, 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 the involvement of civil society was very delayed. They came on board much later in the process. The, there was a, a disconnect between the global dialogues and country dialogues. And there was a, a real time lag. We, in, at some point, there was so much dialogue at the global level, and there was absolutely <clears throat> no one talking about vaccines at the country level. And I think that is problematic. And lastly, the medicalization of an epidemic is a challenge that we always see every time. Any epidemic that we have requires the medical side, but also the social side. And this is why civil society is critical. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Laura, last comment for you. Yeah, just to say thank you so much for the um, really um, interesting questions you guys are posing in the chat. Um, uh, I think it's given certainly myself and I'm sure other, other panel members a lot to, to think on. Um, just to say going forward, um, you know, uh, Gavi is commissioning a multi-stage, multi-method evaluation of COVAX facility and COVAX AMC. But I think just to respond to a couple of the comments uh, in the chat, um, you know, we, we really want to get this right. So actually we're starting, one of the first pieces is we're commissioning an evaluation design and evaluability um, study. And that's really to help us um, try and, and work through some of the questions that, that I'm seeing in the chat about uh, real-time versus exposed evaluation, um, how do we embrace uh, different uh, types of data, etc. Um, so um, a lot of pressure, I think we we, we feel it, um, we, we want to do this well, we want to do it right, um, and uh, clearly from today I think, I think we've got a, an ever-expanding set of evaluation questions, but um, uh, just wanted to say thank you to ITAD for the host, um, I think this has been really rich, um, and um, uh, thanks to you all for your, your great questions and, and hopefully you get the chance to exchange again at some point too. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Laura. And thank you to the, the panel. It's brilliant um, interventions and, 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 and statements. So really helpful conversations. And also to the, the, the questions that are coming. Um, we um, are committing in real time to um, writing up a blog of this, of this session and including some of the key questions that come up in the in the in, in, this, in, the, in the bar on the side. So we're gonna we'll look at these questions and see how we can feed them into the, the, the various discussions. We're always ambitious to try and cover the a small issue of equity and vaccines in, in an hour. Um, and we've just about done it. Um, and I really appreciate everyone's time to join us and be um, listening on this conversation. From our perspective, I think a um, couple of key points, um, really appreciate the conversation about real time um, evaluation, the need to learn lessons as we as we're flying the plane as the analogy goes now more than ever on this on this particular response we can't afford to down the line three years down the line ex post evaluation what went wrong 
um, and how could we have done it better? We need to be learning in real time about how to do this. And I think that's a collective responsibility for everyone involved. And I think the more we can get engaged in these conversations and um, thinking about these questions and engaging um, the, the right people in this, in this discourse is the more the better the chance we have of achieving what we want to achieve and um, um, addressing the, the, the issues that, that, that are playing out. So um, these need to be to close. And um, again, uh, thank you to the, the panel. Thank you to everyone at ITAD to help set this up. There's a lot of work, of course, to make these things happen. Um, and thanks to all of you um, for posing your questions and, and getting involved. And um, we will continue this conversation. Um, but you're all free thank to go you. for the afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.